Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing some of the new discoveries in regards to what the scientists refer to as a kind of a protective shield that seems to surround the satellite galaxies of the Milky Way, preventing the Milky Way galaxy from stealing some of their gas and preventing them from falling apart completely as they interact with the Milky Way galaxy. Something that the scientists refer to as a Magellanic Corona because it surrounds two of the galaxies, the small Magellanic Cloud and the large Magellanic Cloud that you can sort of see right there in the top left corner orbiting around the Milky Way. And so in this case, the scientists are actually solving one of the older mysteries that help the scientists understand how certain galaxies evolve, and more importantly, discovering and confirming a very important feature of various galaxies that allows them to maintain their shape and allows them to continuously create new stars. With all of this described in more detail in a paper that as always you can find in the description below. But I guess let's discuss the problem first and try to identify why this was a problem for a very long time. And actually a good example here is the galaxy we've discussed relatively recently, the relatively massive and somewhat influential dwarf galaxy known as Sagittarius Dwarf. A galaxy that orbited the Milky Way several times now and with every single passage influenced our galaxy quite dramatically producing various ripples and also increasing the star formation during several periods of the existence of the Milky Way. You can find more about this in some of the older videos. With the galaxy itself now being barely visible. As a matter of fact, you can actually see all three galaxies in this image, and of all three galaxies, Sagittarius Dwarf, despite its relatively huge mass in the past, is practically invisible from all of the background dust visible in the Milky Way. And that is actually not unusual. We kind of expect this to happen to most dwarf galaxies as they orbit around a larger partner, in this case the Milky Way. They sort of get shredded apart, they create what's known as the stellar streams, many of which have already been discovered and represent the remnants from various other galaxies, very likely absorbed by the Milky Way over the past 13 billion years. The typical progression for a dwarf galaxy. But sometimes scientists discovered dwarf galaxies that weren't just not disturbed by anything or were barely disturbed, but were actually surprisingly in one piece and were even able to produce stars. And that's actually a pretty big deal, because star production requires a huge deposit of gas and quite a lot of very specific interactions for all of this gas to then start to coalesce, producing star-forming regions. And normally, by orbiting a larger galaxy such as the Milky Way, a lot of the gas is stripped from various dwarf galaxies and is left behind as various stellar streams visible across the night skies. This obviously prevents the star formation from happening inside the dwarf galaxies, as becomes pretty obvious by looking at Sagittarius Dwarf. It wasn't even clear that this was a galaxy, mostly because no new stars here are produced, or at least not a lot new stars, and for the most part this is just various remnants billions of years old. But interestingly enough, the similar streams do exist around the Magellanic Cloud galaxies as well. As a matter of fact, they are actually pretty clearly visible in this image right here. This is a collection of various stars and various gas. And so clearly these galaxies are also losing a lot of their mass and are slowly being stripped apart by the Milky Way. We've discussed this in one of the older videos you can also find in the description. But this is I guess where the mystery kind of starts. We see the streams, we see the interaction, but we also see ridiculously powerful regions such as the Tarantula Nebula that produce huge amounts of stars. As a matter of fact, this is the most active star-forming region in the nearby galactic space. And that implies that there is quite a lot of molecular gas here, and quite a lot of it is still being delivered to the galaxy to produce even more very powerful, very massive stars. This particular region has even been compared to some of the earliest regions in the existence of the early universe that doesn't actually exist anywhere else in the nearby galactic space. But this is a dwarf galaxy that's been actively stripped by the Milky Way, so why exactly is this gas even there? The small Magellanic Cloud, as you can see in this image, also possesses some of these regions. And so this is a bit of a puzzle. How can these dwarf galaxies remain relatively whole and even have ongoing star formation with quite a lot of molecular gas on the inside? How exactly are these galaxies capable of forming new stars? Well, a few years ago, the scientists tried to theoretically explain this by suggesting that a lot of galaxies, and probably all galaxies, will usually have some kind of an envelope or a kind of a gas cocoon which acts as a defensive shield against the interaction with other galaxies or other types of mass. Or in other words, there should be some kind of a really large cloud of gas around these galaxies, very likely formed by a lot of really hot supercharged gas, with the gas itself functioning very similar to a shield. A shield that's made of primordial cloud of gas representing the remnants 
that served as the gas that formed the galaxy itself. And so anything else that tries to enter or pass through the galaxy will actually have to go through the shield first, with the shield then absorbing some of the impact, preventing these galaxies from falling apart or preventing them from losing more mass or more gas. But also representing the first gas that would probably be stolen from these galaxies as they start to interact with more massive partners. Or at least that was the theory based on some of the modeling and some of the initial explanations, especially some of the very unusual observations from some of the more distant galaxies where these unusual cocoons or these shields have already been seen. At least to some extent. And if it wasn't for this shield, there would be really no way to explain how the large Magellanic and small Magellanic clouds are able to maintain their shapes and can still produce stars. And the preliminary calculations did suggest that both galaxies were massive enough to actually host relatively large shields that would protect them from the interaction with the Milky Way for at least some time. But naturally, all of this was just a theory, a simulation, a calculation, but not physically proven. And I guess until now. Because as the title of this paper suggests, the shield or the corona was finally observed. And observed using a relatively brilliant technique that in the past allowed the scientists to look at some of the more invisible things in the universe. But how did they do this? Well, they actually used quasars, super powerful galactic objects very, very far away that emit light coming from everywhere in the universe, naturally created by very powerful black holes really far away from us, but whose light, as it goes through various types of objects or gas, changes just a little bit, allowing the scientists to then figure out what it passed through and even mapping certain things that would be otherwise invisible. Or, as you can see in this image, as these quasars start to emit light and as it passes through the relatively difficult to see shield, some of the ultraviolet light coming from these quasars ended up being slightly obscured and changed by the gas that it passed through, creating very specific patterns that would then be visible by some of the more powerful telescopes on the planet. In this case, the FUSE telescope, Far Ultraviolet Spectroscopic Explorer, that was actually retired a few years ago, but whose data is still available, and of course the iconic Hubble telescope that's able to create extremely detailed UV images. In the process of discovering that the corona seems to stretch for approximately 100,000 light years and actually covers a pretty large portion of the southern sky. But because it's also relatively difficult to detect, there's practically no way to see it unless you use an extremely powerful UV telescope. But if we could see it, it would probably be just as large as the Milky Way itself, if not larger. But this is obviously not the first time this technique was used, and as a matter of fact, just a few years ago, the scientists created this beautiful image that shows us the incredibly large halo or corona located around the nearby Andromeda galaxy, with the dots in this case once again representing various quasars. Here's what all this would look like for the Andromeda if we could actually see it. And so the technique itself is pretty brilliant. It actually looks at various types of silicon, carbon, and oxygen atoms that interact with some of the quasar light, leaving behind a very specific signature that's then used to create an overall map. But in this case, because it's very diffuse and also much smaller than the Andromeda Galaxy Corona, it was extremely difficult to produce this and required nearly 30 years of data of various UV observations. Nevertheless, a pretty big achievement and definitely an exciting explanation to an old mystery of these two dwarf galaxies. Which also naturally explains the evolution of various galaxies as well and will also help the scientists understand how dwarf galaxies evolve as they orbit around the larger galaxies and how they eventually get absorbed and become part of the larger partner. But for now, that's pretty much all I wanted to mention. You can find all of the relevant links in the description below, including some of the older studies on the Andromeda and the large Magellanic clouds, and of course, the paper itself. Thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.